welcome to the Human Flourishing Project. I'm Alex Epstein. Today's topic is the three ingredients of relaxed productivity. Relaxed productivity is probably the number one theme I've had on this show from different aspects. I just think it captures so much of what human flourishing actually consists of, at least you know, if we think of it as as the ideal, because it's it's productivity, so we need to produce value in order to survive and flourish because nature doesn't just give us all the material values and other values that we need, so we need to produce, but we want to do it in a way that is enjoyable and part of I think relaxed is trying to capture a big element of that where we're we're supporting ourselves, we're producing value, but we are we're not feeling stressed, overwhelmed, doesn't feel like a lion is about to eat us or we're about to run out of resources. It's it's a state that's fit for a modern flourishing human being, given the mastery over, you can think of it as mastery over nature, mastery over our environment that a modern human being has. In a very real sense, there's no reason to be stressed out of our minds as we're producing uh, value. Maybe that made sense 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. But for us today, we should be able to produce and be relaxed. For more on that, go back to the episodes on relaxed productivity. Uh, but lately, I've been uh, having um, um, even more success in this area. And I found a specific division of concepts to be particularly useful. So today I'm going to share those. And so I think of these as the three ingredients of relaxed productivity and then the one poison of relaxed productivity. And I find that with these four ideas, it really captures almost everything one wants to do during one's working time and even uh, a lot you'll see beyond working time. So let me start off with the first ingredient, which is the one that has really motivated this show in particular. And that is what I'm currently calling the inevitably productive process, the inevitably productive process. So what do I mean by that? I mean a type of work that we know, and it's going to be very specific to the person and the job. Uh, and it may be that, that for some jobs, it's not, there's not just one, but there may be multiple, but it's just think about what type of process that when you go through it, inevitably will get some positive result. So I'll give you my example in writing. And I forget how much I've talked about this before, maybe none, maybe a little bit, but I have a better handle on it now. For me, the inevitably productive process is to write and edit with an outline. So to write and edit with an outline. So I want to distinguish that from two things. One is to outline without writing. And that sometimes that's necessary, but that has some hazards to it. And then the other is to, so, so there's outlining without writing and then writing without outlining. And I don't want to get too much into this because it's somewhat specific to writing, but the, just I just want to give you a sense of the inevitably productive process versus the not inevitably productive process. With the, sometimes if I'm just outlining, but I'm waiting a long time to write to actually draft the thing, it's easy for me to get lost in the outline and to think through things that I, I'm not fully capable of thinking through because it's just a little bit abstract. So that's one kind of danger. The other danger is if I'm writing, and I'm less prone to this by disposition, but if I'm writing without an outline, it can feel like, oh yeah, I'm making progress, but I could just be totally veering uh, in some direction that's not that constructive because I don't have the clear outline that has the is stating what's the purpose of what you're trying to do and then stating all the steps and making clear how they fit together. But I find that when I have the outline, when I'm writing with the outline, it's almost foolproof for me. That is, I always make progress and same thing with editing. So when I'm working on the current book I'm working on, I find that if I, let's say that there's some, you know, part two of the book I'm finding challenging. I know that if there's a temptation, at least for me, 
to just look at the outline of the book and try to say, okay, I'm not totally satisfied with this, so let me just fix it all in the outline and then that'll make the draft easy. So that's tempting, but it doesn't always work because sometimes I'll look at the outline and I'll and I'll I'll lose sight of the draft and then I'll just I'll I'll make decisions about the outline that actually won't work in practice. Now another thing I could do is just edit the draft and try to fix it at the level of the draft and then that can lead to its own problems. But if if I have the outline and the draft side by side and I I start making edits and I make sure that with each section I edit, I update the outline so that it's the outline corresponds to the current draft, I find that I can iteratively always make progress. And I look I look back on the work on this book and whenever I have the outline and the draft working in parallel, it's it's hard to even think of one day where I didn't make significant progress. Whereas other times I may have made progress. I may not have made progress, but it's much more uh, haphazard. So it's, it's very, very powerful to have this kind of inevitably productive process because it's just, it's, it's money in the bank. It's easier to get started on that kind of process. If, if I know it's going to work well, I, I know that over time, it's going to lead to big results. It makes it easier to plan versus if I'm doing more precarious processes, I can just think, oh, well, what, I might get stuck in my outline for a week and not make any progress or not make any discernible progress. Whereas I know if I do the other thing, it'll work. And sometimes I'll be torn because I think, you know what, I can, I feel like, oh, I can, I can fix this outline at a high level and that'll do it. And, and I find that it's better when I have the discipline just to go through the inevitably productive process. And it may even be that sometimes I'm trading that for, there might be some more lower probability thing that might be higher leverage in some context. And if it's, if it seems super high leverage, then sure, I'll do that. But that inevitably productive process is great because it just means it's that guaranteed forward movement that is so powerful. So of course, it's going to be totally different for different people, but I'll just give in another context, I find that another inevitably productive process for me is with other kinds of work, just a a 90-minute block, like a 90-minute uninterrupted block. Sometimes I'll set it at two hours just to make sure that no matter what happens, I get the 90 minutes. But whatever I'm working on, is, it's I mean, one way to think of it is a 90-minute block with stuff that is well within my ability. So let's say I'm working on a consulting project and it's something that I haven't done this exact thing before, but I've done this general type of thing. That's the kind of thing. Yeah. If I have a 90 minute block or 120 minute block, it's inevitable that I'm going to make a lot of progress. And, and I guess one other element of that for me is a 90 minute block with a deliverable so that's a key facet I should state because it's it's not just, oh, I'm going to spend 90 minutes thinking about it. So I'm going to spend 90 minutes creating something. So it may be a draft. It's often a draft or it may be a next draft, but it's okay. It's It's got to be something concrete. And so what's inevitably productive about that is if I have 90 minutes, I do have time to create something good given my current abilities. And when there's a deliverable, I guarantee that I create something that I can then iterate on versus if I just say I'm going to spend 90 minutes thinking about it, it's, it's that could just spin my wheels or I spend 90 minutes researching, that could end up not working uh, very well. But I find that with a lot of projects, like a 90-minute deliverable is really good. Uh, another kind of inevitably productive process I came up with, just to give you a sense of the range of these things. Now, in mine, they're almost all invite, involving some form of writing. But still, there you can see there's a variety, is I was... I've been creating talking points lately uh, for 2020 elections. So any candidate who is in basic agreement with me on energy and environmental issues, they can use my talking points. And I found that uh, an inevitably productive process for me was actually going on Twitter and drafting the points in Twitter. At first, I was drafting the points in an outlining a piece of outlining software I like called Checkfist, which is great for a lot of things. But I found that I was drafting it in Checkfist, and it wasn't inevitably productive because because it was in Checkfist, I would I would draft stuff that wasn't it wasn't the right length or it wasn't all that good. But it just felt like oh, I've got something on paper. Whereas when I would do it in Twitter, 
because I like all the talking points to be tweet length or less, I could see it there. And it would, it really just locked me into creating something new. And I just said, okay, I'm going to give myself one of these blocks of time and I'm just going to have to do three new tweets. And sometimes I would be able to tweet them out. Sometimes I would need some research. So I'd send them to my researcher, but I just noticed I was so prolific because of this specific inevitably productive process. As long as I knew, okay, I'm actually going to get on Twitter. I'm actually going to type a tweet that I could send out and then I would send it out or at least schedule it if, if it was good enough. That was just this amazing set of conditions. So the, the process involved these conditions and it would always go well. And again, there's just such a power from knowing, okay, this is the kind of process that's going to inevitably go well. And so go well, I just mean that it's going to make forward progress toward your goal. Not that every single day it's going to be a triumph, not that there won't be difficulties, but it, I, I think that if one thinks in these terms, it's impress with almost any kind of project one can think about, oh yeah, if I, if I, if I approach it through a series of these processes, it's going to go well versus there are other processes that are high risk or even <laughs> high probability of failure that I can avoid. And I'm curious for listeners what, what you think of when you think of inevitably productive processes for you and then what you think of when you think of processes that are not productive and whether you find ways to segment your time so large, large chunks of it are inevitably productive uh, processes. So that's the first ingredient of relaxed productivity. And I think it's pretty clear it has the productivity part of it, but it's also the relaxed because if the more the, the the productive results guaranteed, the more one can be at ease in general. Like, oh, I'm gonna, I know that if I'm working from 7 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. on a given day on my book, I know that if I go through this process, I'm gonna make forward progress. And I know a week will be even more and a month will be even more. And so I don't have to worry as much about, oh, am I gonna, am I, am I really gonna finish this thing? Is it really gonna get done? Is it really gonna be good enough? It's just, well, I know if I follow those processes, it's, I'm going to get there. And then that makes the day to day much more, uh, enjoyable. There's actually a book. This reminds me a book I've started to read that, that seems pretty good. I mean, that is so far really good. And I'm going to just, I have it in my thoughtful app. And if you guys don't know what thoughtful is, you can sign up at thoughtful.community to be on the mailing list. It's called the motivation myth. And it's so far got some very good material on motivation. And the basic takeaway I have so far from it, which is consistent with my experience, is that a lot of motivation comes not before the activity, but once the activity has been initiated and then it it feeds the completion of the activity. Uh, so that's the one thing is these inevitably productive processes, once you get them started, they they're going to feed themselves really well because one, you're going to notice the forward progress. And that's that's a lot of what feeds the motivation. So the motivation myth, I'm 58 pages in, and so far it's got a lot of good stuff. And it seems like a quick read in part because there's some a lot of these books, there's quite a bit of repetition. So I find I can scan it quickly, but it, it seems like the guy has a lot of uh, insights. Okay, so once again, number one is inevitably productive processes. Now, let me talk about the poison, and then I'll talk about the um, the two other ingredients, because I think it's e easiest to think of the poison next to the inevitably productive process. And this is, this is not going to be a surprise for anyone. I'm just going to use a different term to emphasize something. So I'll sometimes call these distractions. I'll sometimes call them escapes. But for these purposes, I want to call them focus destroyers. So focus destroyer is anything that destroys focus. And so that can be often social media. It can be email. I find that it's particularly anything where I'm, where there's a, there's uncertainty and interest with regard to what other people are doing. So if there's anything where I'm wondering about, Hey, did other people buy my product? Did I get anything interesting in email? What's happening with something, you know, in, on jujitsu and social media, just anything like that, that is a focus destroyer. Now, the flip side of that is if you do 
if your day has a lot of inevitably productive processes and doesn't have focus destroyers, it's guaranteed you're going to make a lot of progress. And certainly compared to people who are held back by those things, it's just really those are, that's all you need to do at the core. It's just, now there are these two other ingredients, but these, this, this core ingredient and this core poison are really, I think the number one and two things to remember. So again, I, it's so hard to think of a situation where I was, you know, I'm doing this, the right kind of process and I'm not destroying my focus through these other things where it's hard to think of a situation where it doesn't go well. So it's just thinking of it as focus destroyers. I like, because it's just very, very clear. Oh, this is destroying the focus on my inevitably productive processes. So I've talked in other episodes about different ways of dealing with this, but part of it is just conceptualizing it as a focus destroyer for these purposes that, that itself uh, will go a long way. And then there are other techniques such as with the, whatever the things are, it's not that you don't do them. It's just that you put them in a time slot. So it might be, you have one slot for email a day or two slots for email a day and one slot for social media, but just put them in that slot and then they're not a focus destroyer. Then they're just an activity. But if it's just, Oh, I'm going to do something in the middle. Uh, like I'm going to, I'm going to have these kinds of social media type experiences in the middle of the day or when I, when I feel a little low energy from my, during my work that, you know, that is really playing with fire and it's, it's guaranteed to destroy focus over time. Let's talk then about the uh, other categories, and I will. I'll, I'll start with real rejuvenation. So real rejuvenation. Now, I've talked a bunch about rejuvenation on this show, but I just want to stress real rejuvenation as against fake rejuvenation. Because I think what happens often with the focus destroyers is that there's some sort of lull or there's some sort of fatigue, and then it's oh, I got to do something besides this this activity because I'm tired and I need a break. And that's usually fine, but it's just saying, it's key to just say, okay, I want real rejuvenation. So getting stimulation from social media is not real rejuvenation. Whereas taking a walk can be in all the others I've talked about on the rejuvenation um, episodes. And just to give a, you know, if let's just say there's a situation where just feel like, okay, I don't want to take a walk. I just want to take a break for five minutes or something like that. And I'm a big fan of going outside. So I'll never, I'll never say don't go outside. But if you must, if you feel like I must do something that's stimulating, but that's not, then I would say it's much, much better to watch a clip of a TV show or movie that you've already seen. That's key. Like that you've already seen and like, like to do that versus to uh, do any kind of social media thing with feedback or to watch or consume something new. Because if it's new and it's really good, it's hard to stop that kind of thing. So for example, I have, I'm a huge fan of the show Mr. Sunshine, which I originally learned about from uh, Euron Brook at the Ayn Rand Institute where I used to work. Uh, He had recommended this a couple of years ago, I guess. And I just got into it in 2020 and it's one of my favorite shows ever and and I've now finished it. So now I can occasionally as a rejuvenation thing, watch a little bit of Mr. Sunshine, but I know what's going to happen. So I'm not super worried about, Hey, what's like, what's going to happen next with Eugene? Who's one of the heroes of the show. I just know. Okay. Like, yeah, I can, I can take it as this is yeah, I'll just enjoy this world for a little bit if I want a little break. And it's similar for me with Seinfeld. I, I've talked about Seinfeld naps on the show. Like That's a good thing for me to nap with, but in part because I know what's going to happen next. So I don't, It's there's no, no real likelihood I'm going to get into an episode of Seinfeld. Like, oh my gosh, well, how is George going to get himself out of this one? I, I know, I know he's not going to. And I know specifically what's going to happen on that episode. So that's a kind of fun borderline case, but there's just a huge difference between that and something that's an actual focus destroyer where it's really focused on, okay, this, any kind of uncertainty 
about what other people are going to do, positive and negative, that really screws with one's systems in a way that is quite distracting from work. So real rejuvenation, emphasis on real. And then the other one, another topic I've talked about, is high altitude planning. So not, I, I'm not an advocate of doing that at the same time as doing the inevitably productive processes. And often it's good to have a separate day. I often like the beginning of the week or, or a you know, Friday can be good or a Sunday can be good or at the latest uh, scheduling some time on a Monday uh, to do it. So it's definitely good to have that high altitude planning and it's, it's very dangerous to have a week that doesn't have that kind of high altitude planning. But it, it's, I emphasize that it's a separate block and also that it is high altitude. So as in, and part of that is it's not interrupted by focus destroyers. So it's, I'm really think it takes some real thought to think about, okay, what are my priorities next week? And where's everything gonna fit in? And I talked in a recent episode, maybe even the last episode about how to achieve calendar comprehensiveness. So that's that might take a couple hours a week to do. It's definitely worth it. And that's, that's another kind of thing. And then that's not the only kind of thing. There's also high altitude planning for the long term, for, for decades, for half a decade, for the year, those kinds of things. And those are all good. Um, and so that's, that's, another, that's another thing that productive time has. And I think if with those four things, or those three things plus the poison, if you just think of it as, okay, the inevitably productive processes, the high altitude planning, the real rejuvenation, and then throughout... Uh, avoiding the focus destroyers, that's a way of categorizing all the different types of time that you want and don't want for achieving relaxed productivity. So I've found that quite helpful because I can just ask myself, okay, am I doing inevitably, produ inevitably productive processes? Am I doing real rejuvenation? Am I doing high altitude planning? Or am I doing uh, engaging in focus destroyers? And there, look, there are going to be productive times where it's not inevitably productive processes, but it's good to have that as a as something to look for because it then I'll, I, there are a lot of places where there is one, and we're not aware until we think about oh, how can I do this as an inevitably productive process versus doing this as something that's much. Uh, lower percentage or even the kind of thing that has a track record of failure. So that is the idea. Once again, it's the inevitably productive processes, the high altitude planning, the real rejuvenation, and avoiding the focus destroyers. So that's been helping me that much more with relaxed productivity. I hope it helps you as well. That is it for this week. As always, if you have any questions, comments, love mail, or hate mail, email me at alex at alexepstein.com. I should encourage you to do two standard things that I don't usually do enough encouraging about. So one is to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform, including uh, Apple Podcasts is the one that I use, but whatever one you use, use it. And what was the other thing? Oh yeah, leave a review, particularly if it's a positive review. It has quite high positive reviews so far, so I'm not going to encourage you if you hate the show. But if you really like the show, it'd be great to leave a five-star review and to give the reasons uh, why. I think that'll help more people learn about the show. I definitely have not done much at all to market this show. I often forget to post it, but I hear that it gets around via word of mouth. And if you really like it and find it beneficial, definitely tell other people about it. And the uh, giving it ratings and giving it reviews are helpful and probably even subscribing to it is helpful in some sort of way in terms of making it prominent. So try doing all that. Also to get the bi-weekly updates of the new shows, go to humanflourishingproject.com. All right. Wishing all of you a week of relaxed productivity. I'll be back in two weeks. Until then, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been the Human Flourishing Project.